What I think is helpful here is to sort of conceptualize what some of these training variables that we prescribe in our training are ultimately accomplishing. So when it comes to hypertrophy, like the, the primary driver of hypertrophy is, is going to be mechanical tension and primarily tension like at the fiber level. So I, and I, I kind of differentiate there because I think a lot of people assume heavy weight equals more tension and on a whole muscle level, it, it may, you know, or it, it will, you know, if you're do a single with 330 versus a single with 185, you're going to be applying more tension sure. across the muscle. But at the fiber level, we then kind of want to transition and talk about like the, the size principle, which this is probably a review for, you know, a number of people listening to this, but basically like motor unit recruitment scales with, with effort ultimately. So whether that's, um, you know, the ability to meet the demands of a load that's on the bar. So a heavier weight, you're going to have greater motor unit recruitment, like recruitment of more muscle fibers ultimately. And then there's also the scenario of motor unit recruitment in order to maintain adequate force output. So if you do like a set of 10 and you take that to failure, you're not going to like, you're going to progressively increase recruitment up to a point and then it might kind of plateau. But when we look at tension, we want to think of it like, okay, are we tapping into the muscle fibers that are, you know, the higher threshold that are going to have the greatest propensity for muscle growth and in training close to failure is going to accomplish that for, for most people. And, you know, technique refinement is going to help dial that in as well. So if you're just moving the weight from point A to point B, but you're compensating, you know, then it's, it's going to be a little bit harder. Um, you know, when you have lack of stability within a movement, you know, that can limit motor unit, um, recruitment, but ultimately like this is oversimplified, but a way to think about hypertrophy is the dosing of tension at the fiber level. And so, you know, if a fiber is going to grow, it needs to be recruited and accumulate enough time in that recruited state with adequate tension. So, you know, with, with that said, doing more sets is going to address the, the time component load and proximity to failure is going to address the tension component. And so doing more volume can mean a, a few different things. You know, it can mean doing more sets. It can mean doing more volume load, like sets times reps times weight, which I think is, it can be a very misleading way to look at volume, especially across a training career, because it doesn't volume load in and of itself doesn't tell you anything about you know, the, the stimulus or the proximity to failure, you can have very high volume loads, but stop, you know, Get 10 reps effort. shy of failure. Exactly. Yeah. So it, yeah. it doesn't mean much in isolation. Right. I don't think it's a useless metric, but I think number of like hard sets is, is probably kind of the best planning proxy that, that we have there. Um, and so when we, when we talk about progressing volume over time, it's, it's not as much volume that's progressing. And maybe this is, you know, we collectively need to be careful in how we word this moving forward, because I think it, it, it can be difficult to understand that volume in terms of number of sets and, you know, volume load, those don't necessarily have to go up in the long run. Like they, they might a little bit, they might come down for some people as they refine their technique, but ultimately the, the stress at the fiber level needs to be increasing over time. And there's a lot of ways you can accomplish that without increasing number of sets, without doing higher volume loads and things like that. So as you adapt and you're able to perform more reps, you're doing that, but your set volume might not change much. So I think what to expect is like, and this is true for me is over your career, you're going to have like peaks and valleys. 
there's going to be times where like, oh, wow, I'm on a good run here. I'm, I'm able to increase loads on most lifts across two, three, six months, maybe, or even a year. You're just like, it's linear. You're just it going. Is. And you'll probably see like your physique respond to that. Like you'll probably see like, oh, I actually put some size on. But then you'll hit a you'll hit a wall or you hit a valley where it's like, okay, I can't progress these lifts anymore. But it doesn't mean you're not getting that stimulus. So like you just yeah. said, it's like you're yeah. still like, because if let's say a year goes by and now you're up 20 pounds on a certain lift, well, now you're you're doing that 20 pounds consistently as you move ahead, even though it's not going higher, you're still moving it more yeah. than where you were in the past. And if you're still hitting the appropriate proximity to failure, you're going to get a stimulus. Again, muscle, your muscle doesn't, your brain, I should say, don't know numbers. Because I've had a lot of valleys and I don't, it's not like I shrink because I'm it? still training, I'm still putting yeah. the effort in. So that's the thing, like people don't realize that like you're going to have those moments where you just got to keep training consistently, keep putting the effort in, even though numbers aren't moving, you're still going to get that stimulus. Doesn't mean your physique isn't responding to it. For sure. Yeah, that's what's it, hard for people to wrap their head around because they want, it's more about numbers. They want to see numbers move over time, but there's other forms of progress. Like maybe my numbers are stagnant, but like you said, Brian, maybe my bench press looks a hell of a lot prettier now than it did back in high school. Uh -huh. So maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's cleaner, cleaner yeah, reps. Yeah. I'm getting more out of each rep that way. And, and you picked up, you, you commented on something there, Jeff, that a lot of people don't even consider, and that is over time, right? Time is more than a month. <laughs> you know, it's more than a year. It's like you said, Jeff, it's your entire lifting career, you know? Because unlike you, Jeff, I'm a little bit different in that I can vividly remember in 2002 or three, the very, very first time that I squatted 315 pounds. And your peaks and valleys that you talked about, I went through many, 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 many of those. And now, you know, here I am 52 years old, which is what, like 22 years later, I can walk into any gym anywhere and rep 315, you know? And like you said, not only does it look better, it's, it's quality is much, much better. It's, 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 it's almost undeniable that I'm getting much more out of that now than when I very, very first started doing it. So you, that time component, like if I was to draw a bar graph, which I don't even know if people are going to be able to see this, I was actually load wise stronger a few years ago and I'm down a little bit now, but that's still a lot higher than where I was 10, 15 years ago. And I don't know where I'm going to go from here. Maybe from here, I kind of go up a little bit, you know, but that time component, people get locked into just like their gym session and this block and this year, but time, you're talking your whole career. And then kind of going into the next subject, Brian, I'm really going to like to hear kind of what you have to say about this. Our lifting is not in a bubble. It's not like that's the only thing our bodies do is lift those loads and those weights in the gym. And this kind of goes back to my recent vlog that I did when I purposely dropped my volume way, 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 way down. When I was out back here splitting tons and tons of wood and walking around with logs, you know, back and forth, up and down the stairs, you have to accommodate for life and what your body is doing outside of that gym, because we don't live inside of a bubble. And there's all those other things that are either going to A, take away from your training performance possibly, but then B, they might actually contribute to your physique and, and, and unbeknownst to you, maybe your goals as far as you, how you want to look. It could be the fact that you know, sometimes you lower training volume down, talking about like set volume or frequency or what have you, you get more recovery. It is. It is. Now you're able to express your performance a lot better because now better. fatigue isn't getting in the way. It That's is. the way I kind of look Peaking at Peaking 101. Yeah. Training volume over my career, it's like sometimes I have to reset my baseline depending on what's going, like if I'm contest prepping or 
I'm in a maintenance period or like you said, Brad, like something in life, like I got something going on and I need more energy elsewhere. Like I don't look at it as like, oh gosh, there goes all my gains because now all of a sudden I got to drop my volume down. It's like, well, I'm just resetting a baseline. Yeah. Because atrophy doesn't have any, I mean, you're more of the science guy, Brian, but three to five weeks, you would say probably atrophy happens when you stop training altogether. So even if I reduce my volume down by 50%, chances are I'm not going to lose muscle mass. Maybe I get a little detrained. Maybe I can't express strength as much because I'm a little detrained, but actually like tissue loss. Like the only time I've seen tissue loss over 38 years when I stopped training for four months. Then I was like, oh, okay, now I know what muscle loss actually <laughs> looks like. <laughs> and I like, stopped paying attention to my diet too. So I was yeah. like, okay, this is the worst body comp as an adult I've ever had because I stopped training and I stopped watching what I was eating. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. Um, you know, it's definitely... You would be setting yourself up for failure for sure if, as you get older, you insist on moving the needle, whether that be additional reps, additional load, additional sets, whatever it is, like session to session or week to week. Because, you know, like you've said before, Jeff, like the supply and the demand of, of what we're talking about, it's if you have this large stimulus but you don't have the resources to recover from it. Well, guess what? Like it, not only are you not going to be recovering from it, but some of that fatigue is going to mask your ability to actually provide a subsequent stimulus. So it's, it's that balance of managing fatigue is, you know, especially as you advance in your training career and, you know, you have other priorities come up. <laughs>